start. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We'll be giving it just one or two minutes past the hour before we get started, but we're excited to talk to you today. All right, Amos, I'll hand it to you to get us started. Let's get it going. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. I'm Amos Eno, founder and president of LandCan, the Land Conservation Assistant Network, a nonprofit I created in 2000. LandCan is a unique information platform promoting conservation to private landowners and simultaneously supporting their economic viability. For over 100 years, the whole focus of the environmental movement and successive waves of federal and state bureaucracies and their funding have been targeted on acquiring public lands for conservation, particularly in Western states. Yet today, in the lower 48 states, 71% of our land mass is still privately owned. Only land can serves this market comprehensively. What the general public does not understand, and particularly suburban and metropolitan America, is that privately owned lands in terms of ecology, fish and wildlife health, recreation, the creation of food and wood products are the backbone and the most important sector to our nation's ecological health and our rural economies. The historical focus of environmental policies on public land is really misplaced. Today, private landowners hold 82% of our wetlands and 80% of all endangered species habitats. Back in the 1930s, Aldo Leopold, our nation's patron saint of conservation wrote, and I quote, the geography of conservation is such that most of the best land will always be held privately for agricultural production. The bulk of responsibility for conservation thus necessarily devolves upon the private custodian, especially the farmer. He also flatly stated, conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who serves the public interest. This is what NCX offers, a reward 
for conservation stewardship. One of the problems facing private landowners is the elasticity of income from their land from year to year. This can become a fiscal roller coaster. Ranchers face periodic droughts. Forest owners face episodic harvest times. Ranchers face price squeezes from meat packers. Catastrophic rains, hurricanes torment southeastern states. Just in the past week, news headlines blared. Again, I quote, Farm Group warns beef prices could hit record high as cattle inventories decline to a 73-year low because of severe drought. On the 8th of February, the news claimed net farm income is forecast to fall 26% in 2024, the biggest slump since 2006. Programs such as NCX offer a sustainable income that may smooth out these episodic curveballs affecting private landowners' annual incomes. So please listen. And now Andy Morgan, NCX's Chief Product Officer, will take you through NCX's offerings. And I encourage everyone listening to ask questions throughout. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Amos. It's a privilege to be here with you today. And um, I, I love that. I love that quote from Aldo Leopold. It always resonates with me. I'm, I'm also a private landowner myself. And so we at NCX believe strongly in the critical role that private landowner plays in all of these things that you're talking about. So, um, well, thank you everyone for having me. Uh, my name is Andy Morgan. Like Amos mentioned, I'm the chief product officer at NCX, otherwise known as the Natural Capital Exchange. Um, and today we're really going to talk to you a little bit about what NCX does, where we come from. We're going to talk about this phrase, natural capital. It's in our company's name, and um, we think it's an important part of land, uh, especially going into the future. And a lot of it's already known, and some of it's new. And so we'll talk to you about that. Um, and then, uh, Jen, if you'd like to introduce yourself, my colleague Jen has joined as well. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Drum. Um, I'm on the customer experience or customer success team here at NCX. And so officially, now that we're friends after today, you can consider me a resource as you continue to want to learn more about what we're doing at NCX and um, understand how we can help you um, understand what you can do with your land. Thanks, Jen. And so Thank you. Um, so after we cover some of those things, I'll hand it over to Jen a little bit later, and she'll talk about some of these different income producing programs, how to compare them, and then she'll actually go straight into our, our marketplace website and show you how to get assessed instantly for your property and get customized recommendations of programs for your land and how to go through those and, and get connected to the companies that are offering those um, for your land. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, so NCX is essentially a marketplace that helps landowners to discover, diverse, diversify and discover income that they can generate from their land. So we do a lot with our alter alternative revenue streams um, to help support farmers and landowners um, and also like foresters and agronomists like you all. Um, and so NCX, we've actually, so far, we've had 22,000 landowners join our marketplace community representing about 34 million acres over 48 states. And the thing I think we're most proud of is that we've helped to facilitate over $20 million in, in private payments to landowners through our marketplace to date. Um, but we didn't start doing this uh, overnight, right? This has been a, a long journey for NCX. We've been working with landowners for over a decade. And when we started, we were actually really focused on the simple aspect of being able to measure the different forms of natural capital on the landscape. And so we built a lot of software and remote sensing tools that we combined with field measurements to be able to do this. And so we started measuring things like timber, carbon, wildlife habitat, and many others. Um, but what we realized is that without the ability for landowners to readily discover and evaluate all the different revenue opportunities related to these forms of natural capital, the measurements weren't really good on their own, right? So we started to also get into figuring out how can we help landowners and support them with these different programs? How can we help them find them compare them to understand the basics, such as, am I even eligible for this program? And we had a lot of the, the foundation to help do that with our measurements. So that's where NCX comes from um, and, and where we're going um, is really to help landowners to understand and discover these programs in alignment with their management goals and primarily generate these alternative revenue streams from your property. Um, and 
you know, it sounds, it sounds great, but it's, it can, it can be difficult, right? Because we're seeing a lot of emerging programs come out, a lot of companies starting new programs, but it's hard to keep up with all of them. Honestly, there's a lot going on and we've had to dedicate full-time effort just to keep on top of that. Um, let alone get all the information you need to evaluate them, right? Like what are the key obligations for me? Uh, what are the restrictions on me for how long, how much will I get paid on what schedule? What do I have to give up in order to engage in this program? And so there's a lot to figure out. And so that's what, really what we're helping landowners do right now. And you can see a couple of quotes from landowners that have worked with us in the past. Um, but really, we're, we're really focused on being uh, all, an all-in-one resource for landowners to discover these different alternative revenue streams. Um, so we talked a little bit about NCX. We'll talk more about that when Jen takes over and show you some real life examples. But um, let's zoom out for a minute because natural capital is really what we're talking about here, right? Whether whether or not we're talking about NCX, we're talking about natural capital and, um, you know, and, and why organizations are paying for it, right? There's a lot of reasons. And so some of these are forms of natural capital that we're all familiar with, such as wood products, timber, row crops, right? Um, and these have supplied our economy, um, supported our economic development and the livelihood of, of millions for since the beginning of mankind, right? And so these are the types of natural capital that exist today that we, we all know about, but still some landowners struggle to engage in, right? Um, I know like for myself, I have mainly forested land um, and it's difficult. I, I have a less number, a smaller number of acres. It's difficult for me to engage in timber, right? Because unless all of my neighbors are doing a timber harvest at the same time, it's difficult, difficult for me to engage in that form of natural capital. But there are also um, emerging forms of natural capital. A lot of you have probably heard of solar energy by now. It's kind of a love it or hate it, but a lot, a lot of landowners are looking for that type of passive income as well. Then there are, there are forms of carbon. You may have heard of carbon credits and uh, a lot of a lot of hype about carbon credits. And so carbon credits can come in a lot of forms as well, right? There's we, we have one on the far far side here, regenerative agriculture. There are forms of carbon credits that are generated through this type of agriculture and could be anything from more sustainable grazing to silvopasture, which is planting trees on pasture land to sequester additional carbon. Um, which can get you a payment as a landowner for generating those carbon credits, which are then sold to organizations who want to offset the emissions of doing business. So they drive a truck, truck across the city, they wanna be able to offset the cost of those emissions. Um, there's also forest carbon, right? And this comes in multiple forms as well. Um, there are forms of forest carbon, which are simply not cutting down your mature forests and, and essentially going under contract to not cut those down. Um, so trading off against timber essentially for 20, 40, 60 years for a long time in order to guarantee carbon sequestration or to, to mitigate human intervention on that landscape that would prevent carbon from being sequestered. There are also tree planting programs, right? Whether it's um, converting non-forest land into forest and generating carbon that way. So an afforestation type of play or reforestation with, with unique special seedlings that have increased growth and allow carbon credits to be to be generated and sold. Um, and then there are, there are emerging um, programs as well that are just starting up and not really figured out yet, such as paying for different forms of wildlife habitat or biodiversity, um, which mainly is filled by government programs today, but there are private programs trying to figure out unique ways to do this as well. Um, such as creating connectivity corridors for endangered species across the private landscape, right? Um, and then there's even uh, programs emerging for wildfire risk reduction where um, landowners can get um, free treatments on the landscape for reducing the risk of wildfire in their area um, when they're at high risk and getting, carbon, getting paid for carbon credits for emissions that would have otherwise happened if they hadn't have done that with their forest, right? So again, sometimes trades off with timber or even forest carbon, but it's kind of an avoided uh, carbon type of situation. So a lot of different types, and there are many others I didn't even talk about, right? So how do we make sense of all this? How do we get all of this in one place? And I'm gonna hand it over to Jen. She's gonna talk more concretely about how do we compare all these different types of programs? How do we how do we kind of try to standardize that for the landowners so you can compare these things as revenue streams and think about how they align to your land management goals. Then we'll show you some real life programs that we have in our marketplace today and, and what they look like and what they offer and what they restrict. Um, so Jen, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Andy. If you wouldn't mind just advancing one more slide before I drop to the demo. So, when Andy talks about um, standardization and a way to kind of effectively compare programs, 
The words that you see across each of the bullets on the screen right now um, are the ways that we're kind of surfacing all of those highlights and key considerations that you ought to be kind of looking through a lens at um, when you're considering these programs. So you'll see when we go into the platform that each program listing page highlights each of those details you see here, but in kind of high level and overview, um, we surface for you on these listing pages, things like the program overview. So very simply, who is overseeing and administrating this program and what are their goals? Making it really easy for you to understand and um, kind of visualize how they might align with your goals and your ideologies. The key obligation would be, of course, what is it that you tactically have to do or abstain from doing um, in order to participate in that program? This becomes particularly relevant for landowners who may or may not live on the land, right? Because if the key obligation is such that you need to be on the land pretty close to 24 seven, especially in the beginning, um, maybe that's a disqualifying attribute of a program. And we make it really easy for you to know that right away so you can continue to focus on what is really gonna be right for you. Um, term length, of course, right? For how long might you have to do something? Um, and we'll see again in the platform, um, we make it easy for you to kind of filter in or out of your view, the programs that might be longer than something you wanna entertain. So that again, you can really focus in on what is as closely aligned to your goals as possible. Um, landowner costs is going to be kind of considered in two different ways or through two different lenses. There's of course the upfront cost to participate. So things like if it's a tree planting program, the cost of the seedlings and the actual um, labor to, um, to conduct that tree planting. But more um, kind of above and beyond that landowner cost, we help you understand how that might relate to the overall RO ROI of the program Again, we'll get into more detail later on that. Um, and then earnings and penalties. So when and on what schedule do you get paid? Restrictions will be things like um, for the duration of your um, participation in the program, what certain practices or activities might you be prohibited from doing? Um, so think in terms of perhaps harvest restrictions uh, for the duration of a um, harvest deferral program. Uh, those are highlighted in a very easy way for you to understand um, very quickly um, whether or not it's still something you're interested in. And then finally, as it relates to landowner rights, um, making it really clear to you um, the kinds of rights that are in play uh, as it relates to that program. Are those rights being leased or sold? An example in this case might be um, in the context of a uh, forest carbon program. Um, most landowners, of course, will want to know, well, how do your rights as it relates to both the carbon and the timber, um, how are those affected, not only for the duration of the program, but at the program's conclusion? Those are all, um, I guess, everything I've just gone through are the things that we believe are kind of inflection points of decision making. And depending on how they shake out, can either qualify or disqualify a program for your consideration. And so we want to make it really easy for you to hone in on those details. So without further ado, let me just pull up my screen share. And could I just get a gut check from Andy or Amos that you're seeing everything loud and clear? You got it. Great. Okay. So just to orient everybody around what you're seeing right now, um, picture that you've just signed up uh, with NCX. Uh, so this is minutes after I've created my account and I've verified that I, um, I live at the email address I've said I live at. And so the very first thing that we wanna do is start tapping into that technology that Andy had mentioned in the upfront. And the only way we can do that is for you to tell us about your land. So for fun today, since I sit in Denver or right outside Denver, Colorado, I'm going to pretend that I possess land, let's say, go right down here. So I'm going to hone in and I'm going to select over here the option to draw parcels, but there's a number of different ways you can tell us about your land. So actually, let me just zoom in just a touch more so I don't accidentally grab a gazillion acres. You can see here, I'm drawing a nice, easy shape. 
I want to make that a little smaller. Okay. I'm going to save and continue. And this is almost a little bit of a selfish plug for my purposes, because it's always incredibly important for me to understand um, so that we can kind of curate content throughout your experience. We want to know what's important to you. So before we drop over into the programs view, I just want to bring you out to your sort of home base when you're on the NCX platform. Um, so when you create your account, please do me a favor and just drop over here and tell me a little bit about the kinds of programs that you're interested in, because that helps me deliver back to you the best content to keep you kind of um, excited about and engaged with what we're doing. So I'm personally interested in some tree planting programs, harvest reduction, and renewable energy. I'm going to save my program interest, and then it's time to go explore over in the programs. So you can see here, um, I don't know, maybe that was about two minutes between when I put in my land and now I'm over here very easily able to see on the programs page what my particular land is eligible for. So like I mentioned, let's say Jen, who actually lives in Colorado, um, entered her land details and came over to the platform, her eligibility is going to look totally different than the Jen who has her land over in the um, the U.S. Southeast. So um, that's a really important thing to call out because especially, you know, when Andy mentions these big problems we're trying, trying to solve, um, one of the very first layers is not just access to all the information about these programs, but access to the information through the lens of what matters to you and kind of filtering out of your view, the things that are just not, um, your land might not be eligible for. So just to, again, to kind of orient ourselves around where we're at now, um, we're on the programs page, which is basically the marketplace. We default to a view of all kinds of program types and we filter out of your view anything that you're not eligible for. So again, continuing to refine what your view is. All of these buttons represent those different program categories that we touched on at the account setup phase, where you can really dig in and focus explicitly on what particularly what particular programs your land is eligible for. So you can see here, if I click through each one, the offerings continue to refine. So if we go over to, uh, let's go over to tree planting, for example. Actually, I'm going to go over to... And you'll see here that in a, num a number of these cases, it says determining eligibility because I put in a whopper of land. Um, so I, I fictitiously possess 5,000 acres. <laughs> but um, just for the sake of the, the demo here, let's drop into this um, funga tree planting program. You'll see here, it says action required. What that means is by way of that first layer of the assessment that Andy had mentioned, that technological assessment of your land, we believe this land is eligible for this program, but action required means that there are some additional questions that I as the landowner might have to answer if after my review of the program, I'm still super excited and I want to move on. But before we do that, I kind of want to, let me back out a little bit so more of my screen is viewable here. Um, before I opened up my screen share and the demo, we talked about those sort of key consideration variables that uh, we want to make sure we shine a light on for you um, to make it really easy to qualify programs that are you that you're interested in or disqualify them. So some of these things are going to look very familiar to that slide we looked at before we went over to the demo. Right away, you're able to see what is the key obligation. What am I going to have to do? in order to participate in this program. In this case, I'm going to um, replant eligible acres with a certain seedling, right? I'm going to have to do that again for 30 years. So now we've covered off on the, what is it I have to do and for how long? I accidentally skipped and I'll go back for a second here to the real meat and bones of what this program is in the first place. Here's where I'm gonna get introduced to the organization that's administering this program. I'm gonna learn more about them and understand kind of what their ideology is, what it is they're trying to accomplish, why they've been successful and how they've been successful so far. And of course, understand from the right, these details, you know, how quickly I might have to move if it's something I'm interested in. Going back to the program details, we can, 
expand my view to understand some more of those key considerations. So things like landowner costs. In this case, am I going to have to uh, take on the burden of the purchase of the seedlings and the um, and the actual planting processes or not? Is the developer going to take on those costs? Um, one quick kind of selfish plug again for me here is that um, you know you can consider me and the landowner success team as uh, as a resource for you to talk through how to navigate the larger context around things like landowner costs. For example, we might be able to say to you, yeah, you you would have to take on the burden of planting in this case, but there's actually a government program available to you for your same acreage that you can use to kind of cost share or offset that upfront cost so that you are kind of starting out um, at a more net positive uh, place when it comes to your earnings for that program. That's kind of a long-winded way of just saying that you should tap into us as a resource um, so that we can help you kind of strategically figure out the best way to enter into a program in the most beneficial way for you. Moving on from what those landowner costs are gonna look like, um, we'll tell you a little bit more about those eligibility requirements, where specifically that program's being administered, um, how many acres you must have in order to um, participate. And if there's caveats, of course, um, we'll make that clear to you. So it says up you know, here more clearly that there are 250 acres that are required, but we know that this particular developer would accept more. And we want to make sure that's clear to you so that we can work with you accordingly. Moving on to the contract details, of course, we're going to make it incredibly clear for you what those earnings and or penalties are going to look like. So what is this uh, program going to result in for you from a payments perspective? If there's any penalties you ought to be aware of, should you decide to do things like sell your land, uh, for example? Restrictions and landowner rights and property access tend to kind of get bundled into one in a lot of conversations, but we try to make it as clear as possible that there are distinctions here. So uh, when it comes to restrictions, how does your existing forest management plan play with the requirements of the program? Landowner rights, we talked about this before, but this is going to pertain to the rights that are either leased or sold for the duration of the program. At the program conclusion, what do you still retain the rights to and what do you no longer retain the rights to? And finally, property access. So um, what can you expect as the landowner when it comes to access to your property from the folks that are administrating the program? How often are they gonna be on your land and what can you expect? The last thing I'll point out before we go back to the top of the listing to talk about some more of the fun information um, is this community Q&A section. So this is a place for you to peruse questions that other landowners have asked about this particular program and ask additional ones should you have them. Um, my team and I are monitoring these all the time and it's our goal to get you answers to those questions ASAP and we'll always let you know when those answers have been uh, published to the page. So if we go back up to the program listing, um, a couple other things I'd love to point out for you. And unfortunately, it, I'm going to try to find another listing that's surfacing one of the key features I'm really excited to talk to you all about. Let's first, I guess, go back into this um, this notion of what action is still required of me in order to participate in this program. If I go ahead and click check eligibility, this is the moment in time where we're taking that sort of extra level of assessment to say above and beyond NCX's assessment of this land, what other things must be true in order for me to participate? So um, just for the sake of making this kind of swift and easy, I'm going to tell um, tell NCX that I do have an internal road network. I do have public road access. I'm, of course, willing to plant in Loblolly Pine. And in fact, I'm happy to plant let's say 300 acres, and I work with IFCO for my seedlings. So now this is confirming for me that above and beyond the assessment of my acreage, those additional questions I answered have confirmed that I am indeed eligible to participate in this program. This is the moment where you can leverage NCX to um, facilitate an introduction 
to the developer for this program so that you can meet with them directly as close to a digital day and age, kind of look somebody in the eye and understand a little bit more about what entering into a partnership with that program developer would look like. Um, and so you can tell us how you would prefer to be contacted by that developer. So I'll say, I'm happy to be emailed. And in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and say, please get in touch with me, I'd love to learn more. What's important to note here is that still there is no uh, commitment being made by me. I can, and we encourage you to, request as many calls as you'd like with as many developers as you'd like to make sure that um, you are making informed and sort of broadly educated decisions. But what will happen next is that I will hear from, in this case, the Bunga project developer, and they'll invite me to schedule a call with them where I can learn more about them. I can ask to see things like a sample contract and so on. Um, but again, I'm gonna sit in the driver's seat the whole time and I won't be obliged to anything until I decide I want to be. One last thing to call out before I close out this screen is in situations where, like I mentioned, there might be an opportunity to administer more than one program at a time on my particular acreage, this screen here is showing me what that could look like. So while I'm, in, um, I'm enrolled in this tree planting program, did I know that I might also be able to welcome outdoor enthusiasts to my land um, and get paid for their time spent enjoying my beautiful property? So you'll see here, now that I'm back on the project page, because I have told the NCX system a little bit more about just how much of my acreage I'm interested in enrolling in this program, now you'll see what you didn't see before, this time adjusted value calculator. So this is a, um, this is a dynamic and smart calculator based on the exact amount of acres I just told the system I was interested in planting. If we open it up, you'll start to see that what, what we've put together here is a calculation that's gonna show you what your earnings are over time for this particular program, because remember, there is a duration to this program. Some programs might pay you up front, some might pay you in annuities, and this really shines a light on exactly what that looks like, not only over time, but as it relates to any upfront costs that you might've had to incur. It accounts for things like an inflation rate, and it really puts into context the, the sort of delta between what money is worth today versus what it will be worth later. And you can come in here and kind of mess around. Like I said, I told the system I was gonna plant 300 acres, but maybe there's a world where I think I could plant more. What would that look like? Or maybe I am gonna get subsidy for that planting effort. Well, if that goes down, how does that change the time adjusted value? Finally, before I, I think we're almost wrapped up on the demo, but before I, I shut down my screen share, a couple other resources we always make available to you all when we have them are things like, as I mentioned, any other programs that sort of play well with the program that you're looking at. And then for that particular program or the program partner that's administering it, if they have newsworthy events that we want you to be aware of, you can access them in the, in the news section here. That was a mouthful. I'm sure everybody is a little overwhelmed. So we have just shy of 30 minutes left to dig into some questions. Um, let me see. Okay, so if everybody can take a look at the bottom of their screen, there is a Q&A icon um, that you can use to pop questions that you'd like us to answer. I can also uh, make sure that I can unmute everyone and we can just kind of have a, a bit more of an open forum conversation. But um, we would love to to hear from you all and um, you know, answer any questions about anything that we just went over with great speed. <laughs> thank you, Jen, and thank you, Amos. Um, thanks, Jen, for that great demonstration of the NCX Marketplace. And as Jen said, yeah, please raise your hands, come off mute, ask questions in the chat or the Q&A, we're happy to answer. Go ahead, Cynthia, I see you have a question and I believe you'll be unmuted now. Cynthia, it looks, it's, it says that talking is permitted for you. Do you mind giving us a 
I'm sorry. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> How are you? I'm uh, good. How are you? you so this is really interesting. And I came in late on the presentation and I see that it is being recorded. And I'm wondering how can I retrieve that? Oh, we're going to be sending a follow-up to everybody that attended today with not mm -hmm. only the recording, but um, you'll see that, you know, there were some sort of summary style slides that really represent a lot more detailed information, uh, specifically when it comes to some of those key considerations. And so you'll be getting that detailed content um, included in what we share out <clears throat> to everybody. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also... When you went through the eligibility part of whatever a person may be interested in, um, you have to have so many acres before you would be eligible for the program. Is that what I understood? Hold on. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I, and I think what you're referring to is that remote assessment moment we talked about where I've, I've drawn in on the, on the map what my land holdings are. Uh -huh. um, we don't prohibit you from going over to the programs page to start exploring programs, but you saw very quickly that within minutes, um, we have been able to add that layer of eligibility to your experience on the platform. So that means not only can you poke around and learn more, but you'll have visibility of what you are or aren't eligible for within a matter of minutes. What's the least amount under anyone, if you could, if if that's a, a good question, valid question, what's the least amount of acreage that one would be qualified to do? We've got a program on the platform right now that doesn't have an acreage minimum. Um, we've got some that have in the tens and twenties, all the way up to five thousand. So there's kind of something for everyone. Um, in addition to, um, you know what? If I I'll open my screen share back up and kind of show you all. If I go back out to the main view, um, open up just a little more, uh -huh. you can filter based on, um, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I momentarily forgot about something that I thought we had available at this moment in time. But regardless, you can continue to sort of filter down based on your particular preferences or your particular characteristics. So. Right. What that means is you can, you know, very easily and quickly see um, if something aligns with what you're looking for or not from an upfront cost perspective. As I mentioned, right away, when you start looking at the landowner, um, at the details on the project page, mm -hmm. you'll be able to quickly see what those eligibility requirements are mm -hmm. um, and say to yourself, mm, not for me or or it is for you. But remember, let's just say that for this particular program, it says that it requires uh, 250 acres. Mm -hmm. If you created your account with us and you drew on the map something to the tune of 75 acres, this program would show up as ineligible for you. So in a way, there's kind of a, we don't want to waste your time mm -hmm. component to how we're filtering this out for you. So you can kind of rest assured that we're not going to show you something as eligible if, in fact, you're not. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your answers. Thank you so much. Of course. Sonia, go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay. Well, great. I, um, I'm a real estate land professional. I work with landowners, and part of my job is to provide information like this. Now, do you also have a, you have a consumer to consumer software product and also do you have like a business partner option? Um, we or don't tell me software. how, yeah. yeah, tell me how we can access the software in other words. Yeah, totally. So r right now we don't have a special offering for realtors or other landowner representatives that are purely looking to help kind of, um, their existing landowners or even to prospect new land acquisition, things like that. We don't have a product specifically geared, geared towards that, although a lot of the fundamentals are there. Today, what I would recommend is that 
if you want your learners to see this, you can share this resource with them. If they want to invite you to their account, they can totally do that. So we can help them do that and have you be able to see what's on their account as well so that you can have access to all the things they have access to and advise them on the different things that you see for them. All right, we can uh, we can talk more about that later. Yeah, please. And if you if you want, um, we're happy to follow up with you. Um, we'll put our email addresses in the chat and you can just email us and follow you know, so follow up and we'll make sure we get you set up with that. All right. In other words, you're selling strictly to the end user. Yeah, right now we're just helping. This is a free resource for landowners. So we're helping landowners find all the program opportunities and um, essentially the businesses that want to sign up landowners, they pay us when landowners sign up for their program. So it's very simple, straightforward model today. Um, that's more so aimed at keeping it free for landowners. But like I said, we've actually had many folks like you inquire about how you can use something like this in a more uh, comprehensive way than just like an individual landowner. So it's something we're thinking a lot about. So even to hear you say that today helps us make that decision better. So we'd love to follow up with you and talk more in detail about how you would like to use it. And that'll help us figure out what we exactly create for someone like you. Well, I just want to compliment you. This is an incredible tool and it's something that's been needed for a while. So I'm really uh, glad I attended the webinar. Thank you so much. We, we agree. And we're so glad you attended. Yeah. I do see some hands um, on the participant list, but I'm going to try and juggle that with some questions that are coming in in Q&A. Um, so Kendall wanted to know, as it relates to cost share programs, do landowners need to run those down or does NCX help with that? So um, talk about problems that we're really excited to try and help solve because we know that this can be a headache. I'm going to put up on my screen something that we recently just um, brought live for you all. When it comes to some of these government cost share programs, we understand that there's a lot of red tape that can be anticipated. And so we're trying our best to sort of facilitate what that process looks like. So you'll see here on screen, this is a guide that we've created to help you navigate those conversations. Um, and you can kind of consider this as a resource on top of things like the landowner success team. And so again, kind of selfish plug, um, we can kind of help you understand um, as it relates to some programs that you're looking at, what other government programs and cost share programs could also apply so that we can parallel path what engagement with those programs would look like. Andy, anything you want to add? I know this is your uh, this is your baby that's on screen right now. <laughs> well, yeah, government programs are complex. Um, it varies a lot based on your local NRCS office and Farm Service Agency office as to how much funding is available in your county how quickly you can get funded for different things you want to do. But I will say to the question directly, like, do you have to run those down yourself? The answer is from our perspective, we don't want you to have to do that. And that, Jen, actually, if you go back to the other tab you have open there of the platform, you can see that if you click on, especially the wildlife habitat category, which is where a lot of these are housed, a lot of the specific practices are housed. We actually put all of these different government programs on the page for you to evaluate. And they get very specific, right? Like this one's for gopher tortoise habitat, which is mainly associated with longleaf pine in the South. And um, we also have longleaf pine cost share. So you combine these two things, suddenly maybe you're doing something really special on your land aligned to your management goals that can be reimbursed, right? So we try to put as many government programs on here as possible. We do not have them all yet, uh, but it's a it's a process to go discover all the information, put it here in a succinct way for you. But right now we have a lot of the NRCS cost share programs related to forested land. We have some of the Farm Service Agency Cons Conservation Reserve programs. Then we have some of the general programs like EQIP um, and uh, CSP that you may already be familiar with that are just general entry points. So you'll be able to find all of those here and over time we'll be adding more and more of those. What I will comment on is that we're kind of take, we've learned that like the government program path can be quite arduous and so what we're starting to do is to connect landowners with experts like foresters to help them through that process. So if you were to actually go into these government programs today on our website, 
um, we would just lead you to that self-service kind of DIY guide that Jen just showed. But pretty soon we'll be switching it over to actually finding foresters that can help you write management plans to qualify for these programs and also help you navigate the government process, right? Because it's, it's quite arduous and specialized to your exact county. So it's it's hard for us to, to help, help with that when it's so specific and local. So we're just connecting you to experts on the ground that can help if you don't already know somebody, right? So you'll see some of that stuff happening too, where we're, we're going to connect to experts sometimes and not just like the government program, you know, NRCS outreach coordinator in your county, right? So some of that will start happening soon as well. All right, I'm going to go through some additional Q&As. Um, George wanted to know if uh, in order to uh, get started on NCX, um, is it open to the public or do you all need to go directly through us? And the answer is it's wide open and available for you to sign up today. You don't need to have us uh, facilitate uh, that. Andy, it looked like you wanted to grab that. No, no, just oh, oh, sorry. I'm misunderstanding some of these signals that are coming through the Q and A modal. Um, so as part of what we're going to follow up with, of course, is going to be the link that you can use to get started with your account creation. Um, and you'll see just like we saw today that the first thing you're going to do is uh, start telling us about your land so that we can assess it remotely and tell you what you're eligible for. There are a couple here that we we kind of answered with Cynthia, but can yeah. a land manager go through this site to learn about a property's opportunities, or is it only available to a particular landowner? And another similar question was, is there a service you know of um, to help people who are get, looking to get started to buy land? This is a similar use case that we haven't quite formally uh, delivered through our platform, but it's something we're strongly considering doing. So the short answer is anyone can sign up today, select property, and see what it's eligible for. Um, we do do landowner identity verification at, in, within the process. Um, so you wouldn't be able to sign up for any programs if you select someone's land that isn't yours. However, um, you can kind of start to look at some of the land today. Now, some of that is a little bit painful to do because we are designing this for the existing landowners. So we are actually starting to think about and work on how can we build a product based on this that helps land managers actually look at this in a more coherent way. So that's something we're thinking about. And like I mentioned to Cynthia, like you all asking these questions helps us determine if we should go down that path. So thank you for asking it and, and feel free to get on our email list and we'll add you to any updates related to that. Althea, um, yes, currently this is uh, available for landowners anywhere in the US. Um, Mike had another interesting question that I want to make sure I make clear in my answer. Can you input multiple properties under one ownership? The answer is yes, of course, you can. Um, any of your holdings, we want you to put um, into the platform so that we can help you understand what they're eligible for and how you can manage them sort of strategically and in parallel. Something you'll be able to see really soon is um, kind of a world where of all of your acres, right? Let's say there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, but maybe 20 of it is eligible for one program and 40 of it is eligible for another. We're working hard to kind of bring you that visibility so that you can understand how all of your holdings break out um, across the different programs. Yeah, a lot of landowners have asked us for maps so they can see exactly which parts of their property are eligible for what. And that's something that our team is working on as we speak, delivering maps that show you the eligibility on like per acre uh, on the screen, per, per pixel on the screen of what's eligible for which program. So something that's coming soon that we're really excited about. Let's see. There's so many, I don't, I don't know which ones to go for. They're also- um, a, a related one real quick, Laura asked, if you have two adjacent lots, one personal, one business, can you combine the acreage? Definitely, Laura. And when the time comes for us to identify, to uh, verify your identity and that you own those acreages, we'll just ask for a couple of different ways to do that. We try to do that using public records checks, but if it is um, like an LLC owns one and your name is in your personal name owns the other one, that's not a problem for us. You can combine those under one account, no hassle there. Kamran, I'm gonna um, address both your questions together. So Kamran has a question about, okay, well, once I'm 
um, enrolled in a program, what were to happen in the case of something like a land sale or the death of the owner or anything related to a circumstance like that, um, are the terms of the program negotiable? One of the key details that's always included in that program listing page is going to be an acknowledgement of what would happen in that sort of circumstance, right? Do the terms of the contract stay with the land or the land owner? Um, but furthermore, don't forget that you're going to ultimately connect with that project developer after you request a call. And those are gonna be the sorts of questions that will surface in the context of a contract and you will be able to speak closely with that developer about just those kinds of considerations. I love that we have some good uh, questions here about the types of programs. So Laura asks, are there programs that would protect, help protect creeks from, from development essentially? And the answer is yes, right? There are conservation easements out there that are specifically geared towards preventing development that protect water. Um, the one, one that we currently have um, that comes to mind is um, for Sebago Lake in Maine. Um, where they're looking to protect that watershed. And so there are conservation easements that that company, this, this uh, nonprofit offers um, to help that happen. And so that's one example, right? Um, water is kind of an emerging one, mainly covered by conservation easements today, but it's one that's picking up speed kind of as like a newer private um, market uh, that's starting to, to get figured out, but it's not quite mainstream yet, at least not to the level of like carbon or something like that or solar or something like that. Um, another one I saw in here, let's see, further down, I think there was one. Yeah, in, in the example of reforestation utilizing the funga program, did the estimate include only the funga cost or did that include estimated treatment types such as mechanical site prep? Um, Rick, that one, that one included actually estimated treatment types such as mechanical site prep. And we tried to estimate just a general cost per acre replanting in, in the South, uh, in the eligible states that that program operates um, based on data sources that um, we found and also just our own internal knowledge. We have a lot of foresters on staff who have done work in the South. So we kind of just you know call some of our contacts and say, what's it cost in these days? And we kind of estimate that in the calculator. Now you can address that, right? I spoke to someone the other day who said, that's like double what I'm do paying for that. And I was like, great, you can adjust that in the calculator and your time adjusted value is gonna be much higher than what we're estimating, which is a great surprise, right? So like we try to be a little bit conservative in those estimates so you can see what's it worth at a minimum and then you can adjust it accordingly. Okay, somebody wants to know if uh, landowner information is kept private. So um, it yes, of course it is in, in terms of how your information is harbored within our platform and our system. You are also in control. Um, so if you recall when we, at that moment where I decided that after reviewing the Funga program on the, de on the demo, um, I decided that I was interested enough to contact that program partner, I have control over the moment where we say, please share my information with that developer. And so that's the moment where um, they will be um, provided with your contact information to reach out to you and schedule that next conversation. But the, the long story short is um, you're in control of when or if that happens. Yeah, I just want to second how important that is to us. Like we are not like selling your data for advertising or something like that. Like this is purely a platform for you to opt in to who you connect with and who you share that personal contact information with. So when you click request call, that's when we share specifically to that one person, that one company, your information so that they can get in touch with you. And, and, you know, we're thinking about ways to do that in reverse, right? Where the program partners can say, oh, wow, this, this land, I'm interested in this land. I've actually, I'm already know the type of land I want. I'm interested in this. I'd like to request a call with that landowner. And we still won't share your private information until you say, yes, I'd like to accept this request for a call with me from that company. So it's very important to, to us um, to protect landowner information. And so all of your information is protected. You can see all that in our privacy policy and our terms of service as well. It's, it's formalized there, but just wanted to second that it's super important to us. Okay, so this is at the risk of potentially putting Eda or Ada on the spot, but I like your question and I kind of want to probe more. So if you're available, um, I took your mute off. So Ada's question was, can you network landowners who have participated in various programs? And we think a lot about, you know, how we can create 
uh, this community of of landowners who are interested in things like natural capital and and all that fun stuff. Um, so, Ada, are you able to um, jump in and kind of share more about what you were getting at with that question? I I apologize. I've totally put you on the spot, but. Um, if you decide you want to come off mute and share anything further, that's that's something that as um, within my role on landowner success, that's the kind of stuff I would love to dig in on more. I just put my email address in the chat. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to hear more about what you're thinking about there. Okay. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, I It would be very useful for me to, I'm, I'm working on a wildlife uh, habitat. Uh, establishment. It would it would be very useful to me to know other people who have done it in my area, regionally at least. Um, knowing, uh, being able to talk to people who have experience with some of these different programs would be very useful. Um, so, the more I get into it, the the deeper in the weeds I get. <laughs> But it would be very useful to be able to talk to other people who have actually used some of these programs um, and to know what's happening around me, at least regionally, would yeah. be very useful. I love that. I mean, I, I we could just pivot and have a, a conversation about that for the rest of the time. <laughs> um, Ada, I'm going to take your your contact information and circle back with you since I know we're almost at time. But um, long story short, that's exactly the kind of stuff we're thinking about all the time. You know, how do we again really create that sense of community and network um, uh, amongst our landowners so that um, you all can share with each other the things that you've really enjoyed about what you've done and share lessons learned and, and all that good stuff. Are you still adding to your list of providers, uh, Always. businesses? Always. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm working with a company, uh, well, a group, it's a nonprofit group, but they do a very well researched habitat for bees and butterfly plantings uh, and they provide the seed for free but it's a five-year contract to get people to get in it and stay in it long enough to make it work. Um, are you familiar with, with that one? Are you still adding to your list of programs? We're all, we're always adding, always adding. We love to hear about things you're doing that maybe we haven't discovered yet. What was the nonprofit's name exactly? The Bee and Butterfly Fund. Be in Butterfly Fund. We haven't spoken to them yet, to my knowledge, although our team that does a lot of that outreach isn't on this call, so I can check with them, but we'll reach out to them if we haven't. Thank you for giving us that reference. We'd love well, to have I, them. Probably. If you send me an email link, I can send you the contact. That would be fantastic. That would that be, that'd be, be so great. Okay, that'd be good. Hey, and, I'm, I'm coming for you. <laughs> we have Be in Butterfly Fund on LandCan, and uh, they were actually one of our... Uh, de recommended designers for our Monarch flight uh, site. So it's available on, on LandCan right now. Well, I have been very, very uh, amazed with their degree of planning. I mean, they don't just throw a bunch of seeds in the bag and that's it. They they tell you what they're giving you, why they're giving it to you and how to plant it. And then they it's keep checking flight. up on it for five years. So they're top flight. Uh, I I like them. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Ida. You're welcome. All right. I mean, we are we're pretty well at time here. Uh, one thing I do want everybody to be rest assured in is that um, for all the questions that came in that we didn't get to, um, I'll make sure that I put together, um, you know, just a quick document that answers everything and it's included along with everything that we follow up with today, including the recording and, and so on. Let's see, Andy, any other questions that you want to specifically dig in on while we have two minutes left or what do you think? I'm scrolling through here. Um... Let's see. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of questions about how does NCX make money? Uh, fair, it's a fair question. We actually charge the companies who who list their program on our website to find the landowners. And when they find the landowners um, that they need that are interested in their program, then they pay us. So it's more a payment from them to help them identify the landowners because we can assess the entire contiguous United States, any parcel within just a few minutes. It's a pretty powerful thing for them to not have to go through all of that um, and to send people everywhere all the time. So that they pay us for the service and then that's how we make it free uh, for landowners today. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions about that. I see a lot of very specific program questions. I, I would encourage you to follow up with us. We're happy to answer those specifically to your case, so to your land. So if you create an account and ask us a question about a specific program, we can help evaluate that with you and get on the call with you and, and explain what's going on and answer all of your questions. Um, so I'll kind of skip some of those right now that I'm seeing. Um, oh, I see one that would be interesting for everybody to hear the answer to. So Dave um, had has just now entered um, property into our system. And he's seeing already some information related to that program and what the um, the earnings might be for him. But how does that compare to another program? So that gets back to that A, that calculator I walked you all through when you're on that program listing. But again, another selfish plug, um, that's exactly what my team is here to help with. So we can go so far as to kind of get on a consult with you and really kind of dig into the two programs that maybe are your finalists that you're really excited about and go through what that sort of um, NPV uh, or earnings calculation looks like. So please pay attention to the chat, pull down my email address. It'll be in what we follow up with, but that's exactly the kind of stuff that I spend my day working on and thinking about. Yeah. And I will add Dave, like when it comes to like getting up a, a fixed payment per year versus a revenue share, um, you'll see different payment options like that across a lot of different programs. Some of them actually are only revenue share, but it makes it quite unpredictable, right? Like how do you know what the price of the carbon credit will be? And so it's something to consider because it could end up being more, but it's about what do you think about carbon credits and the market for carbon credits? And that's something we can help more on like a one-off consult basis right now, but we're looking also to get more of that type of information. Any information that helps you make a more informed decision is, is our job. And so we're looking at helping to identify those types of gaps so that you know like, well, what is the carbon market like these days? And what are the what is the price of a carbon credit of this type um, and, and so on? So it's something that we can help talk to you about um, separately, but we hope to get more information like that out um, in standardized format in the coming, coming months. All right, well, there are questions still on the table that I hate to leave unanswered, but we are at time here. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I'm happy to stay on a few minutes and answer more of these if, if people stay on. Um, otherwise, like like Jen mentioned, she is going to be sending out a follow-up. She has put her email in the chat. Feel free to follow up with us. We're happy to have uh, individual um, chats with any of you about your land and about the programs it's eligible for. With that, I'll bid you all farewell. And if you did have a question remaining, I'm happy to stay on and, and answer a couple of these. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Enjoy. Bye. Take care. All right. Um, I'll keep answering. Let's keep answering some questions, Jen. Um, hate to leave people hanging. So um, Tom Horn asks, have you had conversations or experience with the Vermont current use program? Actually, Tom, we haven't really gotten into talking to a, 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 any of the current use programs directly, and we haven't listed any of them on our website yet. And the reason why is usually they're a little bit more known already. And so we haven't really prioritized that super high um, to put on the platform. But a lot of the states have a current use program. I'm actually, my land's in the current uh, use program right now, which gives me a great tax break for my land. Um, and they do have impacts on other programs that may make you ineligible for those programs based on the requirement to harvest timber, for example. And if you're required to harvest timber, then it's very difficult to engage in a harvest deferral program that pays you for carbon credits. So there are implications of these uh, engaging in these programs um, and there are trade-offs to make there. So I'm happy to chat more with you about that and how it applies to your specific property. But um, the short answer is we haven't quite gone down the path yet of listing all of those, but um, probably something that's that's down the list somewhere for us to add at some point to our, to our platform. Okay. Let's see here. 
I'm double checking questions and whether or not that person is still here. <laughs> um, A couple of people ask where we're based. I'll just cover this one broadly. Um, NCX actually is, doesn't have a physical office. We're based all around the country because the landowners we work with are based all around the country. So we actually all work from small like office shares or our, our home. Um, and we all work together every day across multiple time zones to serve the landowners that we work with. So we're quite distributed. We have people on the East Coast and the US South. Um, and central and mountain time geographies, and also in the West Coast. So we have people all over the place. George, um, let me just make sure you're still here. So George asked, could a property qualify for more than one program at the same time, hence multiple payments? So yes, it absolutely can. And we'll make it clear to you when that's the case. And that's that notion of stackable programs I mentioned. Um, so for the same acreage, um, when there are different programs that can be administered in parallel on that acreage, um, you can use that notion of stackability to unlock additional revenue opportunities um, in a pretty meaningful way. And I, I would also add that you know, we take stackability very specifically to mean same acre, same time, different programs. And so you know, it's very strict form of stackability, but soon we'll be releasing those eligibility maps I mentioned, and you'll be able to see like for the same parcel, different acres may be eligible for different things, which is not quite stackability because it's not in the same exact acre the way we're talking about it, but it's something you could do concurrently still just on different acres on the same parcel. So enrolling these programs doesn't mean the whole parcel is affected, right? It means that specific acres that are, uh, that are eligible for that program in question are affected. And so you'll be able to see the difference of that um, quite visually uh, soon. This ties to what Kendall asked, which is, you know, basically if you have um, land with a variety of different uh, coverage types, timber, pasture, crop ground, and, and so forth, should those be enrolled separately or not? The answer is basically, if you've got it, enroll it into our, into our system, because to Andy's point, we'll be able to shine a light for you on what some portions of it are eligible for versus what a different portion of it might be eligible for because of that technology Andy talked about in the beginning of today's conversation. Would a program, I'm going to take Rick's question and make it just a touch more general. So um, wanting to know whether or not a specific program would allow or exclude certain things like thinnings before rotation age. That's That kind of information is always going to live in the restrictions section of the program page. So remember when we were on the demo, there was a, a section um, that went into whether or not harvesting or thinning would be allowed for the duration of the, the program enrollment. And that's exactly where you get the answer to that question. And, and Rick, specifically for the one that she demoed, if you're asking about that one specifically, that one does allow the normal um, thinnings for a uh, saw timber rotation of Lavalli pine. So they, they're actually looking for landowners that have managed for saw timber for Lavalli in the past and know the standard management plan or like a, the variation of it. And so, yeah, like the 15 year-ish uh, thinning is totally allowed and expected for that program. So if that's what you were looking for, hopefully that helps. Yes, we can definitely share out information probably via Amos on anything that would be relevant for um, CFE and additional credits for any foresters who are on today's call, if it becomes relevant. See. Yeah, but please reach out to us separately as well if we can help with that. It's not something we really expected to do as part of this webinar, but it's something that will help you with your CFE. That's happy. We're happy to support that. Mike Wolf, are you still here? Mike, I think we got to this, but just in case, um, if you are, uh, if you manage a, a number of different land. Uh, a, a number of different accounts across different clients. So if you're a consulting forester, for example, you can still use the site to go through the process of understanding what those different land holdings are eligible for. Um, that's another perfect example of a case where you'd want to reach out to me or Andy, and we can set you up with the kind of account that would allow you to 
add all the different accounts that you oversee so that you could go in on behalf of each and every one of them to understand their particular eligibilities. Yeah, there's a couple of good specific questions here. So Mike also asked, in the case where timber ownership has been separated mm -hmm. from ownership of the land, are there still opportunities for the timber owner? Um, there could be. It depends on it depends on a few things though, right? Like for example, um, if that timber could be harvested at any time because it's owned, like the timber rights have been sold um, like in a timber lease or something, then it would not likely be eligible for a harvest deferral program. If it's been put under some conservation easement uh, for development or something that's not related to carbon rights, it may actually be eligible for a harvest for a program. Depends on the program's rule, eligibility rules, right? So this is where we can help you navigate that and you can kind of read into the details. But if you find questions like that, you can ask us directly about a program or post that question in the community Q&A on that program's page and we can answer it there for everyone to see. So the other landowners also get the answer to that great question. Um, George, you're still here, I think. Yep. Okay. So George um, wanted to know how best to zoom in on your specific property. Um, this gets back into just the process of loading your land details into the system in the first place. During the demo, I used one of a few ways that we allow you to do that, which was kind of using a tool to draw a boundary. But you can get as specific as parcel selection. So you'd zoom in and actually select the parcels that you possess. Um, you can upload a file. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can tell us about your land um, in a very specific way. Yeah, so if you just click that select parcels button in the top left, George, it'll automatically zoom you into that level. And then you'll just want to search for an address nearby so you can easily navigate the map to get to your parcel but then it'll be outlined there. So you should be able to just click it or, or the or the collection of parcels that, that you own, just click them and select them. Um, much easier than trying to draw lines on, on the map, uh, in my opinion, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Phil, Phil, you're still here. Um, Phil said that this is a wonderful tool for helping with land acquisitions as well, but do we have a program that would help with the funding of a purchase? Um, and we do not at this time. I don't know if Andy, there's anything else you want to add there. No, we don't do like lending or anything that would help fund a purchase of land. Um, you, you, this could help you understand like what what that land might be worth for alternative revenue streams related to natural capital markets, but um, we don't have a funding mechanism for you to help purchase more land. And our last question is from our friend Ada, who has left already. So, <laughs> great. <laughs> Well, th thank you all for your time and for hanging out with us to answer more questions. Um, again, please reach out anytime. We, we're very open and we talk to landowners every single day, um, just like you that have specific questions related to the land. So please set up time with us, uh, create an account, uh, reach out to us. We're here to help. Bye, everybody. Take care. Have a great day.